Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reader. Now we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 15th of July 2019 and the news that would be covered today is given on the screen and the timestamp for the same is given in the description and the comment section given below. And so now with this, let us start with the first section. Now as you already might be aware of, we are currently discussing the various questions that have appeared in the prelims examination of 2019 and how these questions were explained in Daily News Simplified. Now the question that we are going to discuss today is on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the AAIB. Now the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has been covered several times in Daily News Simplified starting from 4th May of 2018 to the latest coverage being on 17 January 2019. Now the first statement of the question with regards to Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that was asked in the prelims examination of 2019 is that AAIB has more than 80 member nations. Now if you take a look at the Daily News Simplified video of 25th of June 2018, you would know that even in June of 2018, the AIB had more than 80 members. Similarly, the second statement within the prelims examination of 2019 had said that India is the largest shareholder in AIB. Whereby from this explanation in DNS of 25th of June, you would know that India is the second largest shareholder in AIB. Whereby it is China which is the largest shareholder within the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Similarly, if you take a look at the Daily News Simplified video of 17th of January 2019, which also states that AIB currently has 93 members, which also includes and involves non-Asian countries. And therefore, with regards to statement number 3, you would understand that AIB does have members from outside Asia. Similarly, if you take a look at the Daily News Simplified video of 24th of April 2019, you would understand that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has worldwide membership and it is China which currently has the largest voting rights and therefore is the largest shareholder within the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Whereby with the help of the Daily News Simplified video, you would have been able to solve this question on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Whereby you would have understood that the first statement is correct, whereby AIB has more than 80 member nations. And similarly, you would have also understood that India is not the largest shareholder of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And similarly, you would also understand that statement number 3 is also wrong, whereby AIB does have members from outside Asia. And therefore, the correct answer to this question would be A1 only. Whereby even knowing the fact that AIB has worldwide membership, you would have been able to eliminate the statement number 3. And if you are able to eliminate statement number 3, you would know that option D, option C and option B are all incorrect and therefore the only correct answer would be A. So hopefully up till here you understood on how daily news simplified videos can help you with your preparation for your prelims examination. And so now with this, let us move on to the first article for today. Now we have taken this opinion based editorial from the editorial page on page 10. Now the main focus of the author within this editorial is that the geopolitical scenario of the world is currently changing. And within that context, it has brought up new global issues for India to deal with, such as the current trade war, the new policies of Donald Trump within the United States, the rise of China, the new Cold War between the United States with Russia and China, apart from other changes within the global geopolitics. Now, according to the author, various aspects of India's foreign policy is therefore also required to be changed whereby various aspects of India's foreign policy is required to be changed to fit the changing geopolitics of the world. Now, up till now, India was able to follow a policy of multi-alignment based on strategic autonomy. Now, what this means is that India will take its own foreign policy decisions on any global issues based on India's own national interest, whereby whichever bloc or country is able to help India in achieving this national interest, India will partner with that country on that particular issue. So for an example, India is currently working with China in climate change talk against the climate change policy of the United States and other developed countries. Similarly, India has worked with the United States in the United Nations Security Council against China's earlier objections to declaring Masood Azhar as a global terrorist. Similarly, India is also working with China in ensuring reform of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. And similarly, India has also worked with China in forming the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank and has thereby worked with China in the reform of the global financial system. However, similarly, India is currently working with the United States in containing China's policy such as the Belt Road Initiative and similarly China's military rise within the Indo-Pacific region. 
And therefore, what you can see from this example is that India has been able to take its own foreign policy decisions on major global issues based on India's national interest, whereby it has aligned with China or the United States on those global issues which support India's national interest. And this policy in simple terms is considered as multi-alignment based on strategic autonomy, whereby India is willing to align with different countries and thereby the concept of multi-alignment based on India's own foreign policy decisions, thereby having strategic autonomy or the autonomy to take its own foreign policy decision based on the strategy of India's national interest. Now, according to the author, the earlier policy of multi-alignment based on strategic autonomy, which India has been following, has now become unsustainable. Now, there are two main reasons as to why this policy is unsustainable in the current scenario. Whether the first reason is because of the confrontation or the increasing conflict between the United States with Russia and China, and secondly because of the unilateral policies of the Donald Trump administration within the United States. Now, recent example of this would be Iran. Now, China and India were the two largest importers of Iranian oil within the world. However, the US imposed sanctions on Iran and demanded for each country, including China and India, to reduce their import of Iranian oil to zero. However, what happened afterwards is that China refused this US demand, but India indirectly agreed. Now, Iran was selling its oil to India at a cheaper rate as compared to the international oil prices. And this was good for the Indian economy. However, because of US pressure, we had taken a decision to reduce our import of Iranian oil. However, this decision might not have been within our own national interest. Now, a similar example is that India wanted to purchase the S-400 missile system from Russia. However, this purchase of the S-400 missile system by India from Russia was opposed by the United States, whereby the United States threatened to impose sanctions under its Katsa law. However, what happens afterward was that India was able to achieve a waiver from the United States and thereby is able to purchase the S-400 missile system. But nevertheless, US continues to threaten sanctions against any future purchase by India of defense equipments from Russia. Now what both the Iran and the S-400 missile system issues showcases is that on more and more issues who are being forced to take side with the United States even though it might not be within our best national interest. And it is within that context that the author has said that this earlier policy of India of multi-alignment based on strategic autonomy, whereby India was able to take decision based on its national interest and thereby aligned with a country which suited India's national interest has now become unsustainable. Whereby because of the increasing conflict between the United States with Russia and China, and because of the imposing policies of the Donald Trump administration, India has been forced to take decisions which were not in our best national interest. Now, it is within that context that we come back to the context of today's editorial, whereby this change in geopolitics such as the trade war, the policies of Donald Trump, the rise of China, and the new Cold War between the United States and Russia requires an alteration within India's foreign policy. Whereby if the multi-alignment policy of India is currently not working, then we have to form a new foreign policy based on the new changes in global geopolitics. Now the author within this editorial does not state as to what should be India's new foreign policy if the earlier policy of multi-alignment based on strategic autonomy is not working. But the author does provide various recommendations that India can undertake as part of its foreign policy in respect to the looming challenges to India's national interest. Now, the first recommendation given by the author is that India now should begin some form of engagement with Pakistan. Now, you already understand that after the Pathan Court terrorist incident, India is currently not engaging with Pakistan on an official level. Now, this policy of India of not engaging at an official level with Pakistan continued further after the Pulwama attack. However, what can be seen is that India is currently engaging with Pakistan, such as in the formation of the Kartarpur Corridor. And within that context, the author has said that India should begin some form of engagement with Pakistan, whereby this current policy of not engaging with Pakistan would not have any form of long-term benefits for India. The second recommendation given by the author is that India should now evolve itself further in the current geopolitics within Afghanistan. Now, as you already understand, that the US has said that it is going to withdraw its troops from Afghanistan. And this has led to countries such as Pakistan, China, Russia and others to involve themselves with regards to the future of Afghanistan. 
Now, one of the most important players within the future of Afghanistan is currently the Taliban. And what is currently happening is that both the United States, Russia, Pakistan, China and other major countries are currently in negotiations with the Taliban. But what is currently happening is that India has said that it is not going to engage directly with the Taliban whereby it supports any future talks with regards to Afghanistan through the Afghan government. Now, it is within that context that the author has said that India does need to involve itself further in the geopolitics of Afghanistan, whereby India needs to engage with countries such as Russia, China, and including the most important player, the Taliban, so as to secure India's national interest within the future of Afghanistan. The third recommendation given by the author is that India needs to ensure the containment of China's Belt Road Initiative within South Asia. Now, as you already might know, India and Bhutan are the only countries that have currently opposed the Belt Road Initiative, especially from South Asia. Now, countries such as Nepal and Sri Lanka have already engaged with China under the Belt Road Initiative. And within that context, India needs to ensure that countries such as Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Bangladesh do not get entrapped under China's economic power within the Belt Road Initiative. And within that context, India needs to ensure the containment of China's Belt Road Initiative within South Asia. The fourth recommendation given by the author is that India needs to avoid aligning with either the United States or with Russia or China within the new Cold War. Now what is currently happening is that it is being seen that India is moving further towards the United States in this new Cold War. And within that context, the author has said that India should avoid aligning with either the United States or with Russia or China within this Cold War. Now this recommendation of the author does seem closer to the earlier policy of non-alignment that India followed during the earlier Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. However, let us wait and see as to what would be the policy of the new government with regards to the growing conflict between the United States with Russia and China. And whether the current government would be able to continue with the policy of multi-alignment based on strategic autonomy in the emerging geopolitics of the new Cold War. The fifth recommendation given by the author is that India must now focus on developing disruptive technologies. Now it is currently being seen that because of the rise of terrorism and the use of technologies by other countries is a much greater threat as compared to military threats. Whether the threat from artificial intelligence, cyber warfare are part of the new disruptive technologies that threaten countries. And within that context, the author has recommended that India should focus on developing such disruptive technologies as part of its defense policy. Now, the last recommendation of the author is that India should continue to build our own economic power. Now, economic power is one of the strongest strengths through which a country is able to protect its national interest. And economic power ensures a growth in international reputation and international power within international relations. Now, within that context, one of the major recommendations given by the author is that India should continue on building its economic power. And within that context, India's objective of building a 5 trillion dollar economy by 2024-25 needs to be strongly focused upon so as to build India's economic power in international relations. So now, hopefully, up till here, you've understood the main crux and the focus of this editorial. Now, you should see this editorial and the explanation given this section from the perspective of GS Paper 2 within the section International Relations and within the subsection Effect of Politics of Developed and Developing Countries on India's Interest. So now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this editorial from the editorial page on page 10. Now what this editorial talks about is that the former warlord within the country of Congo which is located in Africa has been pronounced guilty by the International Criminal Court. Now the news in itself of this editorial is not important for your UPSC examination and there are two aspects that you need to understand from this editorial. First, as to what is the International Criminal Court. Secondly, this editorial also highlights that 2019 is the 75th anniversary year of the Bretton Woods institutions. And therefore the second aspect that we need to understand from this article would be about the Bretton Woods institutions. Now, the International Criminal Court has been covered comprehensively and in detailed manner by Basava Sir in the Daily News Simplified video of 6th of April 2019. Now, the link to the Daily News Simplified video of 6th of April is given in the description section. And what you can do is understand about the International Criminal Court from the earlier video. 
However, we are going to undertake various questions for practice about the International Criminal Court later in today's video. Now what we are going to understand today is about the Bretton Wood Institutions. And we are going to understand about the Bretton Wood Institution with the help of the NCRT books. Whereby one of the recommendations that is given throughout to UPSC aspirants is to read the NCRT books. And therefore we are going to understand the basics about the Bretton Wood Institution with the help of the NCRT books themselves. Now we are going to understand about the Bretton Wood Institutions from a chapter from the class 10th book known as India in the Contemporary World Part 2. Now this book highlights about the Bretton Wood Institution as part of its chapter 3 which is titled The Making of a Global World. Now this book in itself contains an example as to why reading the NCRT books are important whereby a question was asked in the GS paper 1 of May's examination of 2018 whereby the question asked why indentured labour was taken by the British from India to their colonies have they been able to preserve their culture identity over there. Now this topic of indentured labour migration from India has been covered in your class 10th NCRT books. And this is why it is important to read the NCRT books with regards to your preparation for both prelims and mains in the civil services examination. Now the Bretton Wood Institution were formed as a post-war settlement after the Second World War. Now what had happened is that after the Second World War, a new international economic system was formed. And the framework for this new international economic system was agreed upon at the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference which was held in 1944 at a place called Bretton Woods within the United States. Now this United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference is also known as the Bretton Woods Conference since it was held in Bretton Woods in the United States. And the main outcome or the final result of the Bretton Woods Conference was that it first led to the establishment of the International Monetary Fund and secondly the establishment of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development which is more popularly known as the World Bank. Now after understanding the background of the Bretton Woods institutions, what you need to now understand is the main aim. Now after the second world war, a new international economic system was going to be formed. And the main aim of this new international economic system was first to preserve the economic stability of global trade and the global financial system. And secondly to ensure full employment within the industrial world. Now within that regard, in the Bretton Woods conference, two new institutions were formed. First being the International Monetary Fund, whose main aim was to deal with the external surpluses and deficits of its member nations. And the second institution that was formed was the World Bank, whereby the main aim of the World Bank was to finance the post-war reconstruction. So now hopefully up till here you've also understood the various aims which has been given within this section, whereby you understand that the aim of the Bretton Wood Conference that was held in 1944 was to form an international economic order after the Second World War, whereby the aim of this post-war international economic order was to first preserve the economic stability within the world and secondly to ensure full employment within the industrial world. Now when we say the industrial world, during the 1940s, it meant mostly the countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany and others. Now the Bretton Woods Conference led to the establishment of what is known as the Bretton Woods Institutions or the Bretton Woods Twins, whereby it led to the establishment of the International Monetary Fund, whose main aim was to deal with the external surplus and the external deficits of its member countries. Similarly, the Bretton Woods Conference also led to the establishment of the World Bank, whose main aim was for post-war reconstruction. Now as you already understand that most of the countries such as the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan meaning most of the industrialized countries within the 1940s had most of their infrastructure destroyed. And therefore the United States took the lead in forming the World Bank, whereby the World Bank was formed so as to ensure post-war reconstruction of various economies around the world such as of the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan and of other major industrialized countries. Now the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank started their financial operations within 1947. Now what was seen is that after the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank was created, these institutions were basically controlled by the Western industrial power, in particular the United States. Now this control of the United States and to a lesser extent of the European countries continues till date over the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Now there is one important aspect about the Bretton Woods institutions that you need to know. Now the Bretton Woods system was based on the fixed exchange rate 
We have what we've seen is that most of the national currencies, including that of India, was pegged to the dollar at a fixed exchange rate, and the U.S. dollar within itself was anchored to the gold standard. However, it was later on during the 1970s that we see a shift from fixed exchange rate to floating exchange rate. And similarly, the United States itself took a decision to not anchor its U.S. dollar to the gold standard. However, this is an aspect that we'll come to later on within this section. Now, what happened soon afterwards, after the formation of the Bretton Woods Institution, is that it saw unprecedented growth in terms of trade and in terms of income within the Western industrialized nation and also in Japan. However, what happened soon afterwards that Europe and Japan were able to rebuild their economies and therefore their dependence on the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank reduced. So therefore what soon happened afterwards is that after the late 1950s, the Bretton Woods institutions shifted their focus from Japan and the Western economies to the newly independent developing countries. Now what this basically means is that in 1940s to 1950s, the Bretton Woods institutions were mainly focused on the industrialized countries such as of the Western Europe and of Japan. But during this period from 1940s to 1950s, what was also happening is that a large number of countries within Asia and within Africa and Latin America were getting independence from the earlier colonial powers such as the United Kingdom and France. Now within the global financial system, what was also happening is that the Western economies and Japan saw rapid economic development and therefore their dependence on such institutions such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund decreased over time. But what was also happening is that the new countries that got independence during this period, such as India itself, began to look towards the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to finance their own economic growth. And therefore, from the late 1950s onwards, the Bretton Woods institutions began to shift their attention to the newly independent developing countries. So now hopefully up till here you understood on how the Bretton Woods institutions changed after the late 1950s. However, what you also need to know is that these Bretton Woods institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, were still dominated by the former colonial powers. And these former colonial powers were also supported by the United States within the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Therefore, because of this domination by the industrial world, especially the Western world, the newly independent countries within Asia, Africa and Latin America had their economic system still continue to be dominated by the former colonial powers. Therefore, what was seen is that even during the process of decolonization, the former colonial powers and the United States were still able to control the vital resources such as minerals and land within their former colonies by indirectly using the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Now, it is in the 1960s and the mid-1970s that there was a major shift in the international financial system. Now, as you have already understood, that there was a collapse of the system of fixed exchange rate which was formed under the international financial system formed in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 whereby it was during the 1970s that the floating exchange rate system was adopted and the US government shifted its policy of not anchoring the US dollar to the gold prices. Now, apart from the evolution of the Bretton Woods institutions during the 1960s and 70s, on how they came to dominate the financial system of the developing nations, various other revolutions also happened in the geopolitics and the geoeconomics of the world, whereby in the 1960s and 70s, what was seen is that the developing countries themselves formed their own international institutions and organizations, whereby the G77 international grouping increased the ability of the developing countries to commonly negotiate against the Bretton Woods institutions. Now, apart from this, what also happened was that new commercial banks were formed within the Western economies, and similarly, new private lending institutions were formed all across the world. Therefore, what happened is that earlier it was only the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, that were able to provide large amount of finance to developing countries. But what happened after the 1960s is that there was a rise in commercial banks within the Western economies and there was also a rise in private lending institutions and therefore the developing countries had an increased number of choices to take loans from. And this increased competition in the global financial system decreased the hegemony or the domination of the Bretton Woods institutions. Now the last aspect which led to the end of the Bretton Woods system which was formed after the Second World War was the beginning of globalization during the 1980s. 
whereby what happened is that because of globalization it led to the increase in number of mnc's and apart from this there was also a rise in east asian economies such as of hong kong taiwan south korea and later on of china also now these four factors basically led to the end of the hegemony of the domination of the bretton wood institutions which were formed after the second world war and what was seen is that after the end of the second world war up to the late 1970s this particular era of financial system was known as the bretton wood system but the beginning of globalization during the early 1980s led to the end of the bretton wood global financial system so now hopefully you've understood about the bretton wood system from your ncert books now there are two main questions that have been given in this ncert chapter with regards to the bretton wood system where the first question is what is meant by the bretton woods agreement and the second question is explain what is referred to as the g77 countries in what ways can g77 be seen as a reaction to the activities of the bretton wood twins now why is it important to understand the questions that were given in the ncert books themselves because question number 6 was on the indentured indian labor system which as we have already understood was asked in the mains examination of 2018 So now hopefully you've understood about the Bretton Woods institution from your NCERT book. Now you should see this explanation and about the Bretton Woods institutions first from the perspective of GS paper 1 within the section world history and secondly from the perspective of GS paper 2 within the section international relations. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. So now hopefully you've understood about the Bretton Woods institutions from the NCERT books. Now let us understand about the International Criminal Code through questions for practice. Now there are three questions for your practice and what you need to do is pause this video solve all of these questions and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now with regards to question number 1 if you take a look at the statement number 1 International Criminal Court is not the principal judicial organ of the United Nations whereby it is the International Court of Justice which is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. With regards to statement number 2 the international criminal court cannot prosecute government intel institutions for war crimes and genocide whereby the international criminal court can only prosecute individuals and not institutions therefore the correct answer to question number 1 is d neither one nor two now if you take a look at statement number 1 of question number 2 then india has not signed or ratified the rome statute that led to the formation of the international criminal court while statement number 2 is correct whereby the united nations security council can refer cases for resolution to the international criminal court even though the international criminal court is not a judicial organ of the united nations so the correct answer to question number 2 would be b to only now with regards to question number 3 the mandate of the international criminal court means that it can prosecute individuals for crimes against humanity genocide crimes of repression and for war crimes and therefore the correct answer to question number 3 is d 1 2 3 and 4 so now with this let us move on to the next article now we have taken this opinion based editorial from page 11 now this editorial highlights various aspects from a particular book known as caste matters now the main focus of this editorial is that dalit emancipation cannot exclusively rely upon constitutionalism now before moving forward you need to understand that we are not going to understand or take into account the various political aspects which has been highlighted within this editorial now the main focus of this editorial is that dalit emancipation or empowerment of dalit community within india cannot exclusively rely upon constitutionalism whereby the main argument of the author within this editorial is that relying on the constitution is not enough to ensure dalit empowerment within india Now the author has highlighted various reasons to support this argument. Now the first reason given by the author is that liberation through constitutionalism is limited due to the limited ability of the Indian constitution to deliver changes in terms of societal behavior. Now within that context the author has given the example of Surya Narayan Chaudhary versus Rajasthan case of 1988. Now this case prohibited temples from discriminating against Dalits right to worship. and enter sacred spaces within temples how is this verdict given out in this case pointed out the fact that mere enactment of such a law or guaranteeing a right in the constitution of india is not enough and the change is actually required in the heart of the people and not elsewhere 
therefore within this case it was said that it is the willing acceptance of the society which alone is the sure guarantee of eradication of any social evil now what the author is trying to highlight is that the constitution of india has limitations whereby it can pass a law to ensure that dalits are equal to every other member of this society but if this law is not followed or accepted by other members of the indian society then it would not ensure dalit emancipation or dalit empowerment within india and within that context the verdict in the surya narayan choudhury case has rightly said that change is actually required in the heart of the indian society which would guarantee the eradication of discrimination against the dalit community now the second point given by the author is that the constitution cannot be treated as a grievance cell since the constitution of india in itself cannot offer immediate resolution now this is because the accessibility of the constitution of india to the oppressed communities is extremely limited since any violation of rights under the constitution especially the right to equality has to be resolved by the indian courts and this resolution by the indian courts is time consuming and financially constraining now it is within that context according to the author if there is a violation of rights of the dalit community then the constitution of india cannot offer immediate resolution and within that context dalit empowerment therefore cannot exclusively rely upon constitutionalism now the third point highlighted by the author is that there are genuine gaps while considering constitutional morality as a common virtue within india now this is because several individuals and various caste groups within india do not consider the dalit community as being equal to them therefore such individuals and groups would not follow the principles of the indian constitution which provides for equality and fraternity among all indian citizens so the principles of constitutional morality such as of fraternity and equality cannot be considered as a common virtue since it is not equally accepted by all members of the indian society and therefore because of this gap in terms of societal acceptance of constitutional morality as a common virtue dalit empowerment cannot exclusively rely upon the moral principles that have been given under the constitution now baba saheb ambedkar is considered as the main architect and the father of the indian constitution now baba saheb ambedkar was also a dalit therefore when limitations of the indian constitution in ensuring dalit emancipation or dalit empowerment is highlighted this criticism is suppressed by making the argument that this constitution which is being critiqued for being weak in ensuring dalit empowerment was formed by baba saheb ambedkar who was a dalit himself now what the author is trying to highlight is that the various political parties within india are not undertaking multiple steps so as to ensure dalit emancipation within india and the main argument given out by these political parties is that the constitution of india is enough to ensure dalit emancipation within india therefore what happens is that when dalit groups and dalit individuals criticize the constitution of india in having limitations in ensuring dalit empowerment their argument is suppressed by highlighting that the main architect or the father of the indian constitution baba saheb ambedkar was a dalit himself and therefore how can the indian constitution be weak in ensuring dalit empowerment and therefore this becomes a weak argument given out by political parties in india to not take any other steps other than the constitution of india to ensure dalit empowerment now apart from this what you also need to understand that according to the author within this editorial the other methods for attaining dalit emancipation is currently unknown so therefore what you need to know is that the editorial does not give any form of measures which can be undertaken to ensure dalit emancipation other than the idea of constitutionalism itself now you should see this editorial and the explanation given in this section first from the perspective of js paper 1 within the section society and within the subsection social empowerment similarly it should also be seen from the perspective of js paper 2 within the section social justice and within the subsection mechanism constituted for the protection and betterment of vulnerable sections and so now with this let us move on to the next article now we have taken this article from page 9 now the focus of this article is quite small and is provided within the article itself now what has happened is that a question was asked in the parliament of india as to what steps has been taken by the government of india to ensure the protection of the ganga dolphin Now the first step which has been highlighted is that the Ganga dolphin is being protected under the Vikramshila Ganga dolphin sanctuary that currently exists between Sultan Ganj to Kahal Ganj within the state of Bihar. 
Now, what you also need to know is that the Vikram Shila Ganga Dolphin Century is the only dolphin century within India. Now, the second measure which is being undertaken is to push away the Ganga dolphins through sirens and signals. Apart from this, what other actions have been undertaken is that fishing vessels have been provided with propeller guards so as to avoid accidents with dolphins. Now, apart from this, what you should also know is that the Ganga dolphin is protected under the IUCN list as being endangered. And similarly, it is also protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now, these are the various steps which have been undertaken highlighted within this article so as for the protection of the Ganga dolphin, whereby the Ganga dolphin currently needs further protection because the national water wave is being formed between Haldia to Varanasi, whereby Haldia is in West Bengal and Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh. And what is happening is that the Ganga dolphins are present in a major form within this national water wave one, and the Vikram Shila Gangatic dolphin sanctuary also is located within this National Waterway 1. And it is within that context that various questions have been raised as to what protection measures are being undertaken for the protection of the Ganga Dolphin in this National Waterway 1. But hopefully you have understood the various steps for protection for the Ganga Dolphin. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 13. Now what has happened is that currently there is no law commission and the proposal to reconstitute a new commission will be brought by the union cabinet in the next couple of days. Now what usually happens is that a law commission is headed by a former supreme court judge or a former chief justice of a high court, whereby the last law commission which was the 21st law commission was constituted under the chairmanship of Dr. Justice Palbi Singh Chohan from 2015 till 2018. However, hopefully you've understood as to why the Law Commission is currently in the news. But what is required for you to remember are certain facts about the Law Commission from the perspective of your prelims examination and as facts that can be used in answering questions within your mains examination. Now there are two questions for your practice and what you need to do is pause this video, solve both of these questions and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now the correct answer to question number 4 is C, both 1 and 2. Whereby with regards to the first statement, the constitution of India does not provide explicitly for the creation of a law commission. Similarly with regards to statement number 2, currently the law commissions within India are constituted through an executive order which is given by the central government. Therefore with regards to question number 4, the correct answer is both 1 and 2. Now with regards to question number 5, the correct answer is C, both 1 and 2 whereby the advisory given out by the law commissions within India is non-binding upon the central government. Similarly, what you should also know is that the law commission is neither a permanent body nor a statutory body, whereby law commissions are not created by an act of parliament. Now, these are the four basic facts that you need to understand and remember about the law commission. And now with this, we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now we move on to the question for today.